Episode number 60, Choosing to Heal with Monica Lee. Hello and welcome to the Fighting for Connection podcast. I'm Brett Nicola, a husband, father, and fun lover. Listen in as I share stories, tips, and inspiration that will move you toward the connection that you want in your relationship. Today I have on someone who is a member or a student of the Connected Couples Campus and some time ago reached out to me to see if I would come on her podcast, Choosing to Heal. And it was so fun just to spend some time talking with Monica, who is a student of the Connected Couples Campus, and to be able to talk about all the things that we learn inside the campus. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I'm so excited to be able to share it with all of you. Uh, Without further ado, let's tune in to the conversation that I had for the Choosing to Heal podcast with Monica Lee. Hey, friend. There is nothing more that I love than breaking down healing into tangible steps so that it's easy to understand and apply so that it can turn into real life change. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing today. I have Brett Nicola from Pivotal Approach on the podcast today, and we are going to be breaking down the conflict cycle. I stumbled across his content on YouTube, and I loved the way that he explained this so much that I enrolled in his membership called the Connected Couples Campus. And he is being so generous by offering Choosing to Heal listeners 20% off their first three months. So if you ever find yourself fighting over the smallest things, or maybe this is just like a really big point of contention in your relationship. It's like these fights keep happening over and over about the same thing. This episode's really going to help you. Something else I have for you that makes my nerdy heart happy is a downloadable worksheet for you to refer to and fill in as we're going through this episode. I would recommend hitting pause, going to the show notes and downloading that real fast. We're going to be referencing it throughout this episode, especially if you're really visual like me, it'll be super helpful. And in that worksheet, it will have the special code that Brett has for you to get 20% off the Connected Couples Campus. Hey there, you're listening to the Choosing to Heal podcast, where we ditch the small talk for real deep conversations about all that life has to offer. I'm your host, Monica Lee, and my goal is to share insights and tangible tips to help you maximize your potential and live a life full of intention and purpose. From mental, emotional, and physical wellness to relationships, faith, and business, the goal is always the same. We're choosing to heal, grow, and thrive each day. So grab a cup of coffee, get comfy, and let's chat. Welcome, Brett, to the Choosing to Heal podcast. I'm very excited to have you on. I just love the content that you're putting out into the world. So I actually stumbled across uh, your video on the conflict cycle, which is what we're talking about today. And I thought it was so well done, Brett, that I wanted to come find you and I ended up joining your membership. And I just think what you're doing is so amazing and great for helping couples just heal and and learn how to understand themselves better, each other better. So super excited for our talk today. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Monica. And uh, I have to say, I was in your boat at one point myself. I stumbled across the conflict cycle and it changed my life, it changed my relationship. And it changed the work that I do here at Pivotal Approach Counseling and Coaching. So I see the excitement in you and I'm like, I I know what that is all about and, and excited to come on here and talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, so you are a licensed marriage and family therapist and also a couples coach, Mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. I'm sure you deal with this every day in your professional life, teaching couples how to understand their conflict cycle. The first question I have for you is for listeners who maybe don't speak therapy or they've never heard the term conflict cycle, Mm -hmm. could you give us just like a brief Cliff Notes description Mm -hmm. or a summary as to what that means to you. 
Yeah. So we all are in relationships. So I, I don't think this is just specific to like a romantic relationship. In fact, last week I was, I, I taught the conflict cycle in a workplace with employees because the conflict cycle happens in the workplace. And the best way I've been able to describe it to people is that feeling that you get that like not in your in your stomach or that tightness in your chest that you get when something happens in a relationship that you're in. So that could be with your parents, with your best friend, with your romantic partner, really anybody. And the conflict cycle is happening when we have that feeling. And that's really the best way that I can kind of help you understand what we're talking about here. It's that feeling that comes up when we're in relationships. Yeah. It's almost like that triggery feeling that we don't quite know how to identify or pinpoint. Yeah. But yeah. that this is why I love this so much is the work that we're going to dive into today helps put words to that feeling, exactly. right? And it helps us understand why that's happening mm -hmm. when I feel like so many of us, we don't have any awareness. We feel it, but we don't know how to communicate it Correct. to ourselves, let alone with someone else. I love how you describe the conflict cycle in your work inside the Connected Couples Campus as tiny moments of disconnect, mm -hmm. because I think for anyone who clicks on this episode, of course, if you're in a relationship, we all know what it's like to have a yeah. fight that goes on for days totally. over big things, small things. But like you, you mentioned, it's not necessarily like these mm -hmm. big, giant fights. It's the small, tiny moments of disconnect. I think that's why resentment tends to build mm -hmm. over a long period of time. You know, the people who get married and then 10, 20 years later, they're like, what What happened? We're so in love and we're so far apart. Wouldn't you say it yeah. has a lot to do with not understanding the conflict cycle, not learning how to repair yeah. after that happens? Yeah. So it may be that your style when this feeling comes up is to kind of turn down the volume and to like try to make it go away and to stuff it. And oftentimes... With that, when we don't make a big deal about this, you're exactly right. We don't fight. There's nothing really on the exterior that says anything has gone wrong. But inside, mm -hmm. we're just like, oh, we don't feel as attracted to that person. We don't mm -hmm. feel as close to that person. We don't feel as cared for by that person. And what naturally happens is we just move further and further apart. And definitely, I've worked with people who are ready to you know, divorce or, or uh, they're in my therapy office or whatever. And they say, we, we don't know what's going on because we don't fight. Um, right. But that doesn't mean they're not in the conflict cycle. And as we kind of uncover what the conflict cycle is and how they manage it in their life, we find that, yeah, they've been, they've been kind of slowly taking steps back for years and years and years mm -hmm. because they've been feeling hurt within the relationship, but they haven't been like fighting it right. as, as we might describe it. That's a really good point. And I think that can be dangerous territory for couples who, like you said, are under this belief or assumption that they don't fight. Like the conflict cycle is just for those people who fight in their yeah. marriage. But that can be a dangerous belief in that, you know, just because you don't see it on the outside, mm -hmm. it's still a coping mechanism, mm -hmm. just like having this lashing out argument is right. They're yeah. both very destructive in their own ways. Mm -hmm. The difference is at least when you're lashing out, you're like, okay, there it is. There's something that needs to be addressed. But yeah. unfortunately, I think that maybe it's a bit more common for people to fall into what you just described mm -hmm. with the slow disconnect over time. So yeah. I, I really encourage couples to begin to see where the conflict cycle is happening in your relationship. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even have to be that you're having an interaction physically with each other, it can come up just in your thoughts when you're apart from each other and things like that. These little feelings that come up and just start identifying them because the more we begin to get awareness around this, uh, the more our brain will naturally begin to uh, operate differently around it. And really, when we're talking about the conflict cycle, my goal always is we get some awareness around it so that we can operate differently around it so that when conflict happens, we can have a conversation that leads to connection. I love what you just said about it being more what's happening within you to mm -hmm. not necessarily with the other person. And that's good news to me because that means if one person takes ownership mm -hmm. and is able to develop that self-awareness and just shift that belief or shift the stories that they're making up, at least gain the ability to stop it in their tracks. 
like you said, it, that starts to heal as well because mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have to engage to start developing those resentments and that, oh, well, he just doesn't care about me. Mm -hmm. You know, she doesn't ever listen to me. And so I think that's a really common complaint or fear that one person in a relationship has what is like, well, what if he doesn't want to do the work? What if she isn't willing? And this is a really effective way that one person can really shift the trajectory for the relationship. And then by default, naturally, that other person is going to take notice and it's going to create positive change in the relationship. So exactly. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing a personal example, Brett, and I have one to share as okay. well. That's yeah. more like a smaller example of how, you know, we can end up in these ridiculous fights over the silliest things. Before I let you go into your example, I just wanted to remind anyone who's listening that we do have a free downloadable worksheet to go along with mm. the episode. We'll put it in the show notes. What I love about this, especially if you're a very visual person, so as Brett shares, as I share, you can track it on the cycle and then it helps you consider and think about your own cycle as well. So if you want to pause the episode, go download it, print it out, come back. Just super helpful. So go mm -hmm. ahead, Brett. Yeah, I appreciate that, Monica. And inside my office here, I have conflict cycle up on my whiteboard right there. And when I work with couples virtually, we pull it up right on the screen and we go through it. So this is like a very visually helpful to kind of be able to picture and see exactly what's happening. I'll share with you the example that I, I kind of have in my back pocket that I share with all my couples that come in to help them understand the cycle. Because I think once you hear a story like this, you might not have the exact same thing happening here, but you might have something very similar. The example that I like to share happened just a few years into my marriage with my amazing wife, Kelsey. And at the time, I didn't know what the conflict cycle was. Therefore, I didn't know how to resolve this. But it starts out like this. Kelsey was going to go out on a, on a weekend trip with some of her longtime girlfriends. And at first, it wasn't like a big deal, but... The more she planned this trip, the more excited she got about this trip, the more I started feeling that feeling. Like, I didn't know what it was at the time, but I just, I, I couldn't stand when she'd bring it up. I couldn't stand to see her so excited about it. And finally, I told her, I don't really care. Like, she can go on this thing. And as long as she doesn't tell me, I'm fine with it because it, I just was sick of hearing about it. And, and that's what I told her. And I remember her kind of coming back to me and saying, like, Brett, how come you can't ever be happy for me? And when she did, I was like salt to the wounds. I, I was like, are you serious? And got really defensive and tried to explain to her all the ways that I, everything that I do to make her happy. And, and it just seemed like we went around and around it in this situation. And the poor girl went on that trip. I know feeling awful. I was left at home feeling awful. We had a couple of kids at the time and she came back and, and we still couldn't like get this resolved. Looking back, I'm sure she was kind of hurt at how I handled the situation. I felt like she didn't really get it. And finally, after about three or four days after she got back, we just kind of winked and pretended like everything was good and went on with her life. And those kind of things would happen in those early years quite a bit where we'd have these like disagreements. We'd pretend that they never really happened. But the biggest thing that was happening is we weren't ending up getting closer together, right? right. They would happen. And then we'd just be kind of left like, huh? That's not really working out. Right. And, and then it's like you just want it to go back to normal. You're, t you're tired of feeling disconnected. So it's like, all right, let's just move on. And then yeah. it never gets addressed. Yeah. Yeah. That's what would happen. And we just slowly through these things move further apart. And then years later, I was working with couples and I was trying to help couples who are in conflict as well. And, and some of their conflicts were much bigger than the ones that I was facing. And I was as a couples therapist at the time, trying to be as helpful as I could. And at the end of the day, it felt like what I was doing is I was refereeing their disagreements, right? They'd come in and I would help them understand who is right and who is wrong and who should do more of this and who should do more of that. I'd give them kind of these assignments. They'd go out, we'd kind of take care of the fight. And then the next week they'd come in and they'd say, hey, Brett, uh, that was great. But then on Tuesday, we got into this other fight about this other thing. Can you help us with that? And uh, I could tell that it wasn't helpful for the couples. Like in, in the moment, we were able to resolve their fight, but I wasn't helping them repair and actually have a different dynamic in the relationship. So I reached out to some of my, some of my colleagues. They pointed me to EFT is what, what a lot of this comes out of, emotionally focused therapy. 
And I remember sitting in that class as I was learning about the conflict cycle. And all of a sudden, it was just like all these like light bulbs started going off. And I came home from that class and I, and I said, Kelsey, I think I, I'm figuring out what's happening. And she's like, well, what's that? And I said, you know, like when you, and we can go back to this example of her going on the girl's trip. When you're going on that girl's trip, I get worried. I get worried that you'd rather be with those girls than you'd be with me. That's what it felt like. That's what it seemed like. She was so excited to go with those people. And I didn't see that excitement with me. Uh, now she spends 51 weekends a year with me, which is pretty amazing. But this one little thing seemed to inform me that she was more excited to be with them than with me. Now, hang in here because that's not true at all. She would rather spend 51 weekends a year with me than with them. And she was excited to go for this on this weekend. But my brain didn't see it that way. In that moment, mm -hmm. my brain got a little bit what we call dysregulated. And I felt rejected by her. I felt like I wasn't good enough. Like she didn't want me. She wanted her girlfriends. And uh, I started explaining this to her. And I remember her looking at me like, she's like, that just blows me out of the water. Because in those moments, I get the sense that you want nothing to do with me. Aww. And that's how I cope with those big feelings that come up. So I just turn off my emotions. I go cold. I pull away. I shut down, leaving her kind of feeling like, yeah, there's this man that she loves, that she thinks is amazing, that doesn't want to interact with her, doesn't want to talk to her, doesn't want to hear about her exciting trip. And then that leaves her feeling really disconnected. Connection is so, so important to that girl. And she loves just like knowing all the details and having conversations. And when I shut off, she gets left feeling like these really big disconnected and alone feelings. And when she feels alone, she cries these big alligator tears. I always tell her, do anything but cry. But uh, she cries. It hurts me so much to see her cry. And when I see her cry and she comes to me with those like, why don't you want me to be happy? It reinforms me that she's not happy with me, that she doesn't like me. Right. And around and around we go. So at the end of the day, what we began to see was we both were worried that the other person didn't care about us. And we were both simply confused because we both adore each other. We both love each other. And yet in these little moments, these little small moments in life, our, our body, our brain gets the same sensation from probably previous relationships where we got hurt, where we didn't feel that care and love. And our body keeps and holds on to these sensations and tries to forecast the future. So it's mm -hmm. like, ooh, if I'm feeling rejected here, that's not good news for this relationship. And now I'm kind of in a fight, flight, freeze response. Uh, once we can learn how to move through them, uh, it, it's amazing for, for the relationship. It really is. Absolutely. And, and man, that that example is so relatable, Brett. I'm sure everyone who's <laughs> listening can think of their own situation, whether it's girls night or, or something else, yeah. where I think what's really hard to unravel is how can two things seem so contradictory. It's like we know in our head that this person that we love really does care about us, really does want us to be happy. But in that moment, it also feels so true that this yeah. person clearly doesn't want me to be happy. That's yeah. so hard to unpack. It is. But like you said, with the conflict cycle, um, what I love about it is it starts to make sense. Mm -hmm. And how much of conflict just doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. If I can next, just kind of put words to what you just described. Sure. So we can kind of walk people through the steps of the yeah. conflict cycle. And then once we go through that, I can share my own example now with that verbiage. So you mentioned that it starts with that feeling, mm -hmm. that triggering feeling that we can't quite put words to. And then there's either a push-pull dynamic, right? So mm -hmm. you mentioned that you pull away. That's also my MO, okay. whereas Kelsey, she really wants that connection. So mm -hmm. she's going to go towards you to seek yeah. Hey, why can't you be happy for me? So there's always that push pull dynamic. Then the surface level emotion always communicates. And this I think is, was the biggest aha moment for me. And, and not just with the conflict cycle, just in developing self awareness or growing as a person in general is I always believed my feelings to be the truth, <laughs> right? And once we discover that, oh, that's actually just a coping mechanism. And I have these deeper, more vulnerable feelings beneath the surface surface, it again starts to make so much yeah. more sense. Understanding 
that the surface level emotion is what shows up when there are those deeper feelings beneath. And mm -hmm. part of learning or understanding your conflict cycle is developing awareness of what your go-to vulnerable emotions are. Mm -hmm. And typically it's always like a very common narrative or it's consistent no matter what the fight is about. Mm -hmm. Each of us will have this common belief that we've adopted due to trauma, due, mm -hmm. due to our life experience. And then the way that we cope with that, and when it's, it's too much because nobody likes feeling shame or guilt or fear mm -hmm. or pain or hurt or feeling like rejection. So naturally, it makes so much sense why we would protect ourselves with these cover emotions like anger, mm -hmm. pulling away, shutting down, criticizing, mm -hmm. all of those things. Defensiveness is big. Oh, that's, that's my go-to. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if we go back to the example of Kelsey heading out, this is how I kind of really break down the conflict cycle in my head on the fly. And it sounds like this, the more I feel rejected, the more I pull away, the more I pull away, the less Kelsey feels connected, the less Kelsey feels connected, the more she feels alone, the more she feels alone you know, the more sad she gets and the more critical she gets. Mm -hmm. And the more critical she gets, the less I feel desired and, and wanted. And then we can go Which all triggers. around. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and there, there's around that again. trigger again yeah. that starts the whole thing. Yeah. So good to be able to fill in the blank and have that language, which makes it just so clear as day on paper. The um, advantage of that, Monica, mm -hmm. is if you if you can do that for your own relationship, then you can be anywhere. You can be, you know, at the supermarket, grocery shopping, or out on a date or something like that. And conflict can come up and you can be like, okay, what's going on here? The more I feel blank and, mm -hmm. and you can go through that process and you can begin to see the confusion that's happening there versus the uncare and the unlove that you think is happening. Absolutely. Right. Cause it's like, once you know that your core wounded belief is I'm not good enough or mm -hmm. I'm not desired or I'm not wanted. Once we can put words to it, it allows us to tap into, you know, the truth in that process to be able to move through those feelings mm -hmm. a lot quicker. And I think this, <laughs> this thought has come up quite a few times as we've been talking here and maybe it can help illustrate the confusion that does happen and how our cover emotions aren't in alignment with our underlying attachment lines. Maybe one of the strongest examples that I see with the couples that I work with is one person who's saying, I want a divorce. And really, as we work with them, that's the furthest thing from the truth of what they want. They don't actually want a divorce, but they're saying that on the surface and, and they're really trying to communicate to their partner I need you to see how hurt I am. I need you to see how disconnected I feel, but they don't have the language for it. Yes. And, and they're caught in the cycle and they say things that just add confusion to the relationship. Cause, oh man, um, I just got chills because that is my MO and has been even since I was a teen with mm -hmm. my relationship with my parents was mm -hmm. that protest behavior. Yeah. Like if you're not going to see me, hear me and come to me to meet my needs, what can I do? What Hail Mary yeah. attempt can I do to show you how hurt I am, how much I need your help, how much I need your love. Yeah. And this just goes to show if we never learn these skills, it absolutely will carry it through adulthood mm -hmm. to where we still don't have that language. We're still acting out. And yeah. we really believe that we've like yeah. gaslit ourselves to believe that we actually want a divorce. Yeah. But then it's like you leave that therapy session and you're like, wait a minute, I still really care about this person. Yeah. What is it's so confusing. It is. Before we hop in actually to my example, you mentioned the phrase attachment longings, and I feel like that's a good term to dig into a little bit more. Yeah. I have some examples here, and you mentioned like your attachment longing of feeling desired and mm -hmm. wanted, Kelsey's being that she wants that connection. What are some other examples of attachment longings, common ones that you see with couples? Yeah, we see a lot of, of like wanting to be seen, wanting to be heard, wanting to be appreciated, connected, valued cared for, respected, appreciated, desired or wanted. There's probably a few others that are out there, but those definitely are ones that we see quite common. Yep, absolutely. While we're on the topic of like defining terms and just throwing out some examples just for listeners to be able to hear these examples and identify like, yep, that one's me. Some common examples of those vulnerable feelings that you can't quite put words mm -hmm. to 
really common ones, fear, Mm -hmm. right? Like what if she leaves? What if they don't care about me? Sadness, loneliness, shame. That's mine is I'm not good enough. There's a difference between believing, oh, well, I made a mistake and I am a mistake. I am the mistake. Neglect. And then lastly, the cover reactions, common ways that people will then cope with those feelings they can't put words to, acting out, which is anger, Mm -hmm. defensiveness, withdrawing, shutting down, stonewalling. And then on the flip side of that, there's the criticism, right? I find that there's always one that's coming towards with like the attack and then the the other one's pulling away to defend. And Um, and I'll jump in there because I think mm -hmm. sometimes I, I see a lot of people get confused about the pursuer because we talk about it being like, criticism or attacking. And uh, sometimes it can be really neatly tied into a bow and given as like almost this gift. Like it's very sweet. Like maybe you should get therapy (laughs) or, oh, you know, I think if you just would do this and it can be said in very sweet kind of cute little ways. But what happens is, is you're exactly right. It tends to trigger our, our partner and it tends to have us putting the responsibility on our partner to care for us. And that's where that cycle continues to happen. Absolutely. I'm a huge advocate of personal accountability in relationships Mm -hmm. because I was that person and I still am. Let's Mm -hmm. be honest. It's my knee jerk reaction to try to fix and control and manipulate the other person. So I don't have to take accountability. They're the problem. They're the ones that made the mistake. They have to fix it. And man, what a huge shift it made in my relationships once I learned, oh my gosh, I'm literally trying to control them. I'm I'm operating under the belief that if they change, that'll be the key to my happiness. Yeah. And what a lie that is. <laughs> okay. So I have a fun story to share, which yeah, is, like I'm, I said, an example it. of how we can get into these cycles over the most ridiculous things. So my partner, Joshua and I, we love nerdy board games. I don't know if you've ever played the board game Wingspan. Have you heard uh, of it? I haven't. I've played a lot of board games, but not that one. Okay. It's on the level of like Catan, super nerdy. Yep, okay. It's like $70 on the shelf, <laughs> but it is by far our favorite game. And we play oh. it almost every night. That's like our ritual for connection. And yeah. it's just like, once the kids are in bed, we set it up and we play Wingspan. So there's little bird cards and you can lay eggs on the bird cards and you score points based on the types of birds you have and whether they have eggs laid on them. Okay. Okay. So one of the round end scoring was how many birds you have with no eggs. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, Joshua thought that meant birds that can't lay eggs that cannot physically lay eggs because there's like a feature for that. Okay. I took it to mean birds that have no eggs on them. So they could lay eggs, but whether or not you choose to put the eggs on them. So at the end of the game, we're doing the scoring and, you know, we're in conflict because he's like, wait, I thought that was birds that can't lay eggs. And I was like, no, it's birds with no eggs on them. Mm -hmm. Well, halfway through the game, he had paused to ask for clarification. He said, so wait, I'm confused. It's like this, right? And he points to a bird that can't lay eggs. Well, I saw a bird that had no eggs. And I was like, yes, just like that. (laughs) So big miscommunication. We think we're on the same page. Not at all. Yeah. So at the end of the game, I'm like, no, babe, it's birds that don't have eggs. And he got frustrated because he's like, well, I asked you earlier, were you even paying attention? Because I feel like if you were, you know, were you even present with me? And that triggered me off to the races because I was like, I absolutely was fully Mm -hmm. present. And it's true. He is right in that I tend to really lose focus easily. I have ADHD. I'm Mm -hmm. super distracted. And so that is a common trigger that you know, we're both having to deal with is like, I I have to make extra, be extra mindful about my presence with him. So it makes sense to me that he would jump to assuming that, well, you just weren't paying attention. You're, you're probably off in la la land thinking about work or something else instead of here with me. Well, his attachment longing is just like Kelsey to have that quality time, Mm -hmm. that connection and that presence. Mm -hmm. He also grew up as a kid with a really troubled 
parent situation. So he never felt seen or cared or heard. Mm -hmm. So for him asking for clarification and by me misunderstanding him, it was triggering that wound of like, nobody ever pays attention to me, to what I have to say. Like nobody ever listens to me. Mm -hmm. So then as he's expressing these frustrations or these minor hurts with the birds with no eggs, Mm -hmm. I was getting triggered because I actually was paying attention to him. And my core wound and belief is I'm not good enough Mm -hmm. and I'm not accepted the way that I am. Um, That comes from my own childhood, my previous marriage, which had betrayal. I I just adopted this belief. I'm not good enough. If I was good enough, people would want me now the Mm -hmm. way that I am. I wouldn't have to be something that I'm not. And so in my mind, I'm like, oh my gosh, he sees me right now as someone who's not paying attention to him, but I am. Mm -hmm. And so my default was to go to that defensiveness. Like, yes, I was paying attention. Did you not see me? I answered the question. Why would you just assume I wasn't paying attention to you? Mm -hmm. Well, now we're both triggered. And then we move into that part where we're trying to cope or trying to gain that Mm -hmm. attachment and gain that safety back. And so the way that showed up for him was trying to get me to hear him because that was the disconnect. She doesn't hear me. What can I do to get her to hear me? So he Mm -hmm. said, Monica, can you just validate the impact it had on me? Mm -hmm. Because I get that wasn't your intention, but it still hurt me. Can't you see that it would Mm -hmm. still be hurtful? Mm -hmm. And for me, the way that I was trying to gain that safety back, which was I need him to know my good intentions. I need him to see me in a positive light. Otherwise, Uh I'm going to feel that shame is what it was. I was like, well, first, I want you to see and validate the fact that I wasn't (laughs) you know, ignoring you. And so we got into this terrible fight over birds. Yeah. (laughs) I, Monica, the whole time you're explaining that, I just felt super excited because (laughs) you described that and went through that perfectly going down to the stories that have come from our childhood often or significant previous relationships that inform these big feelings that we have. And yeah, we end up fighting about birds, but we're really fighting about something much more important. Right. And I think that is so important to understand because that was something that Kelsey and I had like, why do we get into these big fights about these stupid things we'd call them? Because we weren't fighting about stupid things. We were fighting Mm -hmm. about our care for each other. And you're exactly right. We get caught in this. Once you do this, then I'll do that kind of trap. If we're talking about eggs, it's the old chicken or for the egg type of scenario. And if that's the only way to solve the cycle is that our partner first does something Mm -hmm. before we can do something, we're stuck. Oh, man. Yeah. And I'll be the first to admit as much as it's painful. My ego doesn't like to admit it, but my true authentic self will. (laughs) I'm very rarely the first one to take accountability. And that's my own stuff that I am still continuing to work on. But I will say that the moments where my partner, Joshua, who is much better at conflict than me, Hmm. at resolving and repairing conflict, when he is able to go through and resolve his own internal feelings first and come to a place of calm. And he approaches me with that calm. It creates that safety within me. Now I'm not, I want to be really clear. Anyone who's listening to this, I'm not advocating for your partner to calm down first so that they can feel safe for you. I just want to point out that if I also possessed that skill or I was better than that, which I want to be as a partner because Mm -hmm. I want him to also feel safe and like his feelings matter. It's like we get so stuck in this stubborn place of a feeling protective, but really it's creating the exact opposite of what we want. Mm -hmm. And so if we can let that go and be vulnerable and be a, a safe space for the other partner, it creates change in the relationship as a yeah. whole. Yeah. So two thoughts on that, Monica, because I'm in the same boat where I tend to want someone, you know, kind of apologize or make me feel like they want me before I can kind of respond yes. apologetically in return. And you're right. It's, it leaves us kind of feeling stuck because th- something that comes up very big for me is when we're in conflict, I tend to feel like I'm the problem. Mm-hmm. And so if I'm the problem, then I'll just remove myself. And if you want me back, prove to me that I'm not the problem. Oh man. Um, and, and <laughs> sounds like we're cut from the same cloth. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so then we, I don't want to apologize because 
I'm like, well, I don't, I don't even know if you want me. But what mm-hmm. I've had to do is I've had to switch this in my brain where even though I feel like I'm the problem, I'm actually the solution. And that for me has been really important for me to hold on to that I can resolve this by moving towards Kelsey away from my MO of moving away from her. Yep. And then you're exactly right with when Josh is able to come to you and uh, manage this conflict and, and help you feel a little bit, little bit better, things go well. Uh, I would say the response, if you're caught in a cycle, the responsibility to resolve the cycle is 100% on you. Yep. Now, the magic of a relationship is our ability to go and regulate our partner. Mm-hmm. So once we regulate ourselves, Right. We actually can go in and we can assist in this process and reassure our partner that we care about them, that they're important to us, that we love them. And when we're able to take our partner who's maybe dysregulated, reassure them of our care for them, we bond. That is a really, really good point. I feel like especially in today's day and age where it's usually these polarizing opposites. It's the belief that, well, I'm only responsible for me. It's like this very independent, autonomous thing, which don't get me wrong, there is value in autonomy. You absolutely have to take a personal accountability. But unfortunately, in some cases, it swung so far in this direction where there's no value in a relationship. It's just two individual people. And then on the flip side, we get into that codependent and mesh territory, which, where it's the belief that the only way I'll feel better is if my partner changes, if they do this. And so I think that it's really important to point out and highlight what you just said, which is that a relationship is meant to actually support one another. Mm -hmm. And it is okay Mm -hmm. for you to want to aid in that ability of providing safety to your partner to be able to help them regulate. And hopefully, ideally, the goal is that both partners have that desire. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I'm thinking about my own relationship and in many situations, it's not going to be equal 50 yeah. 50. In some, you know, one fight, one person's going to be mostly in the wrong and not handling it well, yeah. or both acting out really poorly, or mm-hmm. the other person is having a better day and just mm-hmm. able to access their skills better or, mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah. But I think it's such an important thing to point out that relationships are meant to be supportive mm-hmm. and it doesn't have to be only up to you or only up to them. Yeah. Yeah, we, we're just looking for those moments where we can help and assist each other. And you're exactly right. There might be a relationship where one person is experiencing more pain than the other mm-hmm. person, right? And dysregulation comes from pain. So there might be someone who had experiences or worries or trauma in their life that has them more dysregulated than you. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that might require for you to have a secure bond in that relationship you might have to be the one that, you know, reassures again and again and again that you're amazing. You're important to me. I care about you. I want to be close to you. I love you. And the more you can do that, the more you can impact the ability for that person to move out of their pain and to become someone that then is able to reassure and and securely bond with you. When we look at relationships that have stayed connected over a long period of time, it's their ability to manage conflict in a way that they can reassure each other of their care. And if we're both in our own pain, we might not be able to reassure the other person. We're, we're both waiting for the other person to do that. And so right. we end up disconnecting over a long period of time. And if we're both in this very painful place and we're not able to reassure each other, we're not going to experience that reconnection on the other side of conflict. Yes, so true. Man, I could sit here and talk to you about this all day Uh, going through example and example. But since we don't have all day, I would love to hear just closing thoughts for anyone listening who now gets it. Like they've had this light bulb go off. It's clicking. Oh, my gosh, that is me. That's how we act. You know, I understand my conflict cycle. I know in your Connected Couples Campus, you have a course or a video specifically on owning your cycle, Mm -hmm. but could you give us just like the quick, short Cliff Notes version or just a little taste? And then, you know, if they want, they can come to you and learn more about like, what are the next steps for healing this conflict cycle? Yeah. So, so just a really Cliff Note version of that is uh, when we become aware of our cycle, the thing that we want to do is we want to own that. We want to take 100% responsibility for the cycle. And and right now, uh, 
Monica shared that little infinity loop. My goal with the individuals that I work with, even when I'm working with couples, it's individual work. I think the best couples work is individual work to basically make like a like a P on its side, uh, meaning that you're completely regulated even when your partner is dysregulated. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the work that we're doing in, inside of CCC. And that's what you are doing when you own your own cycle. The best visualization I can give of what that looks like It's like a mother with a child. Maybe you have a child who's hurt, who's crying, who's really dysregulated. And you can watch a mother kind of come in and say, it's going to be okay. You know, mama's here. Mama loves you. I love you. You know, gentle. And she's regulated. The child's dysregulated. Just because she's regulated doesn't mean that the child just, boom, happy, big smile, right? The child might be dysregulated for, I've seen 10, 15, 20 minutes. And a mother can just patiently be there reassuring the child that it's going to be okay and it's all right. And that is the work that you can do when you own your own cycle so that you can give yourself the best opportunity for the relationship that you want. Because I find so many people feel stuck. They feel trapped. They want so many of the things that are inside this relationship. There's so much good. There's so many things in their life that are important to them within that relationship, but these like conflict cycles are so painful. They don't know Mm -hmm. what to do. And this is a solution that you have that you can use that isn't going to control your partner. It's not going to make them into who you want them to be, but it's going to at least cut through the confusion. So you know exactly the relationship that is there and you can uncover the care that might be there in that relationship that you're having a hard time seeing. Oh man. So much easier said than done, isn't it? <laughs> oh, it is. It's been, uh, I, I came across this like, what, five years ago now? And um, I, I still use this every day in my own relationship with Kelsey. I have to say, man, it feels like we're completely confused here. But I want you to know that I want to figure this out with you. And that's how we begin to unravel our conflict cycle. And right. and uh, we call those, uh, actually, Sue Johnson calls those bids for reconnection. And to your point, I think that once we're able to name it, like actually communicate what is happening to our partner, it, like you said, it creates so much more intimacy and bonding through the resolution of mm-hmm. conflict. And that's such a great way to look at it as conflict doesn't have to be this negative thing. It's an opportunity for growth, an opportunity to choose to heal and come (laughs) closer towards each other. And it's funny, I was printing out all of these worksheets for our recording today, the outline and the the worksheet. And I took notes about the story just so I would remember all the details. Mm -hmm. And Joshua saw it on the counter and we're playing wingspan last okay. night <laughs> talking about he was like man i looked at all of those notes that you took and it was so nice to be able to zoom out and have an objective non-emotional discussion about it when we're both regulated and connected and that way we can do the the learning and the growing when we're regulated mm-hmm. in hopes that it will translate the next time that we are triggered again and we fall back into our cycle because we will. Yes. <laughs> yep. the, we're never here trying to get rid of the cycle. We're just trying to learn how to move through the cycle to repair to connection. When we can do that, it's a beautiful thing. We feel closer on the other side of connection. We can securely bond with each other. But yeah, it doesn't mean that everything is 100% good feelings from there. Yeah, like there is no end goal of being fully healed, right? That's not the end goal to remove the conflict. The end goal is learning the skills for how to work through it and manage it, which which is exactly Mm -hmm. what we just did today. So I like it. Brett, thank you so much. I love having these conversations and just getting to talk about stuff like this. It totally fills my cup. So thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks for Um, having me on. I I wanted to ask you for our listeners, where can people find you and how can they work with you? Yeah, Yeah. so the best way to find me is on my website, www.pivotalapproach.com. Otherwise, I'm on Instagram, a little bit on YouTube, Facebook, all at the handle at Pivotal Approach MN. And you have a podcast. And I do have a podcast. Yes. The (laughs) Fighting for Connection podcast, which talks all things that you heard here today. Uh, I kind of beat the drum of the conflict cycle. We get in fights looking for connection. and, And the podcast really gives tips, tricks, and inspiration that help you have the relationship that you want in your life. So I love it. 
And also, you have been super generous in offering our Choosing to Heal listeners 20% mm. off their first three months yep. if they join you inside the Connected Couples Campus, Correct. which is what I am personally a member of. That's how I found you. So I know you do therapy, you do couples coaching, but you mm -hmm. also have this campus, which is essentially like a content library, yeah. I would say. So especially for people who like listening to podcasts, if you like to consume content that way, if that's how you learn and you just like to binge one after mm -hmm. another, I feel like that's such a great affordable way to fast track that yeah. knowledge and learning. Yeah. And even the couples that I work with one-to-one -one are inside that campus because there's worksheets there that they can utilize much like the worksheet that you held up here today, where they can sit down they can process through some of these things. And it, it really is, like you said, affordable kind of content that you can do at any point in the day. You don't need to schedule anything. It's like when, you, when you're on the treadmill, cleaning the house or doing something, you can plug it in and, and listen and choose to heal as you say there and figure out how to have that relationship that you want. Well, Brett, thank you again. Mm -hmm. And I can't wait for our next chat on yeah. your podcast, yeah. right? That is yep. the plan. So, Looking forward okay. to Monica. Thanks, Brett. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye. This has been the Fighting for Connection podcast. If you've enjoyed this podcast and want more content like this, check out my Connected Couples Campus, which can be found on my website, www.pivotalapproach.com, and become the difference you need in your relationship.